for lunch. Throngs of college students are heading to the cafeteria to get their lunch. Kristen, along with her friends, is among them. So many choices. What will she choose for lunch? Her friends are having pasta and chili, but she has chosen to have the corn medley and a bowl of rice. We are fortunate to have so many food choices. But have you ever really thought about where the food you eat comes from? What type of corn was used to make that shell? How did farmers grow that brown rice in your sushi? And how did they keep the brown rice from mixing with the white rice during processing? How did they keep the type of cotton used to make your shirt from mixing with the special type of cotton used to make your sheets? And what about organic foods? What do organic farmers have to do to bring you that package of certified organic corn chips? Ever think about the clothes you wear? Where did the cotton come from that was used to make your shirt? And how did all of these products get from the field where they were grown to the store where you bought them? California is a good place to start to answer some of these questions. California is known for its diversity. Landscapes, climate, people, perspectives and lifestyles all vary greatly within the state. And the state boasts an especially diverse agricultural sector. Unlike many Midwestern states where field crops such as corn and soybean dominate the landscape, California is home to more than 250 different fruit, vegetable, and nut crops. The next time you visit the grocery store, feast your eyes on the cornucopia of fresh fruits and vegetables that are available to please your palate. There is also a wide variety of packaged foods, bulk grains of all shapes, colors, and flavors, such as the fine-textured, aromatic, long-grained basmati rice or the nutty, soft-textured, medium-grain black rice. Although this choice is obvious at the supermarket, perhaps what is not so apparent is what it took to provide this selection. Where does this wide diversity of foods in the market come from? And how does it get there? Let's see how much work is involved in something that many of us take for granted. The availability of a wide selection of delicious food choices all identified and displayed according to their type. You'll learn how farmers use special high purity certified seeds to ensure crop uniformity and how they guard their crops from weeds and insect damage from germination through harvest. You'll see how farmers contribute to our knowledge of food and farm life by providing opportunities for the public to visit their farms and learn where food is grown. Although many consumers are unfamiliar with food's journey, farmers have developed methods and practices to address cornucopia's challenge. That is, the challenge posed when agricultural products coming from the same region, but possibly grown using different farming methods, need to be kept segregated to meet differing market requirements and consumer preferences. Somehow the white corn used to make white corn chips is kept from cross-pollinating with the blue corn growing in nearby fields, organically grown cotton from conventionally grown cotton, and different rice varieties all remain distinct from planting to sale in the grocery store. To see how this is done, we are going to follow the journey of three crops, corn, rice, and cotton, through seeding, harvesting, and processing to their final destination, you the consumer. Did you know the average American spends less than 10% of their income on food? At that price, you might think it is easy to grow and deliver this abundant cornucopia of food choices to your table. Let's have a closer look. Meet farmer Greg Hawes. He runs his family's farm in Anderson, California, where he is the sixth generation of Hawes to farm on the land. Why does he do it? I guess uh, farming gets in your blood. I can remember being just a few years old and driving a hay truck for the first time and um, helped my dad and, and uh, always chasing after him when he was going irrigating. I'd always try to run and catch up with him and, and just being around it. Um, you know, after college, I became a CPA and actually worked in the public accounting field for about four years. And I just had to get back to the, to the life of the, of the farm. Farming has always been a hard way to make a living, but have mechanization and technological developments made it easier for farmers today? 
traditional agriculture is really hard to make a living. Um, everything has to be perfect just to pay the bills, and then if something goes wrong, then you're, you're operating in a deficit. So what had to go right just to produce that bowl of corn medley that Kristen is eating? Where did those golden corn kernels come from? They actually came from an ear of sweet corn. When corn ears mature, they can be used as animal feed, or food for us, or the corn kernels can be dried and used as seeds. When a single corn seed is planted and watered, the seedling inside the kernel wakes up and pushes its way out of the ground. The plant grows to around six or seven feet and usually produces one or two ears of corn, each made up of around 500 to 600 corn kernels. But how do these kernels actually form? Farmer Don Cameron is a first-generation farmer in Helm, California. Corn's a uh, very interesting plant. On the top, in the tassel, we have the male flower parts that carry the pollen. During a real short period of time, probably no more than a week, the pollen is shed from these areas here. And it falls down on the, on the silk. And then a pollen tube grows from the end of the, the uh, silk here down inside to each kernel of corn, which is in the ear. As we look at this, when, when an individual grain of pollen hits the end of the silk, a pollen tube grows down and pollinates the kernel of corn. The pollen that fertilizes the female flower parts does not usually come from the same plant so it is referred to as cross-pollinated. Pollen itself from corn doesn't travel a tremendous distance, uh, probably no more than a couple hundred feet. Sometimes corn pollen can travel farther than this, and that may create a problem if different varieties of corn cross-pollinate. For example, if you are growing white corn destined for white corn chips, you don't want it to cross-pollinate with colored corn and organic sweet corn producers may be concerned about cross-pollination by a biotech corn variety, one created by genetic engineering. Farmers have ways to minimize unwanted cross-pollination. They can plant buffer zones to interfere with pollen movement, or they can stagger plantings so that pollen shed by one variety is not alive when the second variety has silks ready to receive the male pollen. So growing corn sounds easy, right? Do you think the farmer can relax until harvest, waiting for the crop to mature? Not exactly. The biggest challenge we have in farming is, is, is and why we have to spray, is for weed control. Um, all the crops, you have to have a clean crop to have good production. So alfalfa, grain, basically all the crops we have to spray for, for weeds. We also have to spray for insects. Our orchard's a good example. Uh, we spray several times a year. Um, all of our fruits and vegetables we have to spray, you know, keep the worms and the bugs out. Weeds are a problem because most cultivated crops, like corn and cotton, don't compete well against weeds. The weeds compete for the water and sunlight that all plants need to grow. How then are weeds controlled? Some farmers use chemicals called herbicides to control weeds. But it is difficult to find a herbicide that kills the weeds and not the corn, because the herbicide may act to kill them both. To address this problem, biotech varieties of herbicide-resistant corn have been produced through a process called genetic engineering. These biotech corn varieties are genetically modified organisms, also sometimes called GMOs, some of these varieties produce a different version of a protein they already have that enables them to survive contact with certain herbicides. Producers who choose to plant biotech varieties of corn can then use a herbicide such as Roundup to control weeds because spraying will not damage the biotech corn crop but the surrounding weeds will all die. Other farmers such as those who use organic farming practices choose not to use synthetic herbicides or biotech crop varieties, so they need to come up with a different solution for weeds. Don Cameron uses both organic and conventional farming practices to grow corn on his farm, and he also plants some biotech varieties. Now the, the differences in farming, the organic corn, biotech corn, and conventional corn, uh, 
with the with the biotech corn, we plant it and we spray it with Roundup once it's emerged, and uh, virtually all of the weeds are eliminated. Uh, we, we may have to come in and cultivate one time. After that, mainly just to get the water down the the uh, rows. With the conventional corn, we'll apply different herbicides prior to planting and possibly after planting, including with that uh, two to three cultivations. Uh, with, the, with the organic corn that we're growing, uh, we have like I say, no other weed control other than mechanical cultivation. So after we plant, we come in as soon as we can, as soon as the ground's dry enough, we do mechanical cultivations three to four uh, cultivations, as long as we can get in the field before the corn gets too high. Uh, and even with that, then you see we have a lot of weed competition for the nutrients in the water. So it, uh, it's a much more difficult crop to grow organically. Weeds aren't the only pest competing for the corn. Insects such as the corn earworm are sometimes an unexpected visitor in fresh sweet corn. This insect is the reason why the ends of sweet corn are often trimmed off before you buy them in the market. Worm damage is certainly a constant problem for the farmer. In addition to the damage that the worm itself does, often other diseases and molds come in afterwards to make matters worse. Some farmers use another type of genetically engineered corn called BT corn to protect against insect damage. The seeds cost more, but in certain situations where there are a lot of worms, some farmers think that it is worth it. Yeah, our corn that's not BT type corn, every thing in the gamut has happened because we didn't spray it. Um, worms and there's rust and smut and um, it's, it's, it's a pretty, pretty sore sight. BT corn carries a gene from a naturally occurring soil bacterium called Bacillus thuringiensis, hence the name BT. The bacterium produces a substance that creates holes in the gut of certain types of caterpillars and has been used by backyard gardeners and organic farmers for decades. It is harmless to animals and insects other than caterpillars. More recently, the gene for this insecticidal substance was added to make BT biotech corn so that when the earworm starts to eat the corn, it dies. Yeah, this is a good example of some BT corn and why we grow it. Um, if you peel the, <clears throat> peel the husk down, you'll see uh, just how perfect the corn is. Um, traditionally, traditional corn, you'll, the worms just crawl right down there and you'll see a whole bunch of worms here and there'll be little trails eating down into the, the cob and, and this is perfect. So, um, you know, everybody likes good corn, so it doesn't get any better than that. Remember Kristen? Corn isn't the only thing she was eating for lunch. Is that rice she's mixing with her corn? Where did that come from, and how was it grown? It certainly seemed like farmers ran into some difficulties growing corn. Let's see how difficult it is to grow rice. The way rice is grown is very different from that of corn. Fortunately, there are no rice earworms, but it still takes a lot of work to grow rice. Rather than being planted with a tractor pulling a planter as corn was, Commercial fields of rice are usually seeded from airplanes and the seeds are dropped into fields that are covered with a shallow layer of water. Rice seeds end up in the water where they have been bred to be able to germinate and grow. Weeds struggle to grow underwater. So this is a way to protect young rice seedlings from having to compete with weeds. Prior to planting rice, seeds are soaked in water to start the germination process. The seed is loaded onto a plane and then using a global positioning system or GPS like the devices you can use to get driving directions in your car. The pilot delivers the seeds using the precise coordinates for the flooded field. The seeds sprout. Their leaves rise above the water and after several weeks the field is drained and the sprouted seedlings continue growing. Seeding has to be precise because there are many different varieties of rice. Short grain, medium grain, long grain, basmati, brown and sweet, all grown in close proximity. 
Each variety has its own distinctive taste and texture. Although we often purposefully mix foods during cooking or on our plate as Kristen did, we expect the rice we buy at the market to consist predominantly of the variety on the label. Practically speaking, trace levels of seeds from different varieties and other impurities are present in the food and produce we purchase. In most situations, these low levels do not present a problem for the seller or the buyer. Some specialty and export markets demand exceptionally high levels of purity and have low or no tolerance for the unintended presence of off types or impurities. Growing products for these markets requires careful coordination with neighboring farms and use of identity preservation systems to deliver a product of the specified purity. So when farmers plant different varieties of rice, they must use accurate coordinates to limit seed drop to only the intended field. Compare this to planting corn, where planting the right variety for a given field just required loading the correct bag of seed into the planter. However, in contrast to the cross-pollinating nature of corn, the biology of self-pollinating rice assists in isolating rice that is planted in different fields. The way rice plants produce grain is different from corn. Although rice flowers have male and female parts just like corn, they do not produce tassels to send pollen into the air. Instead, rice almost exclusively pollinates itself while the pollen and egg are still buried deep inside the plant. As the plant matures, you can still see the pollen sacs, and so it is possible for cross-pollination to occur on rare occasions. Once the rice plant has matured and the field is dry, the grains are ready for harvest. A combine harvester cuts a 20-foot wide swath of rice, separates the rice kernels from the stems, and the husks from the kernels. The rice is then loaded onto a truck that takes it to the rice mill. At the mill, the rice grain is cleaned, graded, and sampled for off types, and packaged for delivery to the market. Seed for planting a particular type of crop needs to be reasonably free of impurities and seed of the wrong type. The seed industry has well-established guidelines and standards for producing seed crops and this seed certification process generates seed that meets a specific level of purity, although seed producers cannot achieve 100% purity. On the farm here we grow quite a few different seed crops, um, anywhere from organic sage seed to different lettuce seeds. Um, some of the seeds that we grow, some of the plants we grow, don't cross-pollinate. They may be very similar in their varieties, but they do not cross-pollinate. They can be planted as close as two feet from uh, one another and have no uh, contamination between the two of them. You know, when we do certain seeds that could cross-pollinate with each other, uh, we have certain guidelines that we adhere to that are determined by the association that uh, certifies our seed. Some of them may be as far as a half mile apart, some may only be 100 feet apart. But when you're dealing with seed production, you're dealing with the parent crop and you really need to be careful. Uh, it's much different than the food and fiber production that we do on the remainder of the ranch. Seed that is produced outside in the open air can never be guaranteed to be 100% pure. And so certified seed is held to a 98% purity standard, meaning 98 out of 100 seeds are the intended variety. Using certified seed helps assure farmers that they are predominantly planting the variety that they think they are planting. Achieving higher purity levels, like 99.99%, means allowing only one off-type seed in every 10,000 seeds. And this level of purity is virtually impossible to achieve in outdoor farming settings or mixed processing facilities. I use fresh certified seed every year. Uh, we don't save any of the own seed. The main reason we want good seed to you know get the maximum yield and if you start saving seed then you start getting impurities in the seed and they just you don't get as good a stand. Of course after all the hard work to keep things separate we almost always mix it all up in food preparation and cooking anyway. But isn't that half the fun? Trying new ingredients and food combinations? What about the clothes we wear? Cotton is grown for fiber and has been used for clothing for thousands of years. 
But did you know that there are also different types of cotton grown for different uses? In California, there are uh, two basic types of cotton being grown. Uh, the most common one that's been grown for 50 years in much of the state are the upland cottons. And most of that has been the Akela cotton, which is a subset of uplands and a very high quality cotton. But even higher quality is a Pima cotton that's been grown in California for about the last 15 years. Pima cotton plants produce fiber that is long, strong, and fine. As Pima is a higher quality cotton variety, it is usually reserved for luxury uses, which command higher prices. Cotton is planted in rows in the spring. Like other crops, weeds and grass compete with the cotton plant for soil nutrients, sunlight and water. They are controlled by mechanical cultivators, herbicides, or farm workers with hoes, depending upon the type of farming system that the farmer employs. Approximately two months after planting, flower buds, called squares, appear on the cotton plants. In another three weeks, the blossoms open, and the female ovules are receptive to pollen. Inside the bowl, moist fibers grow and push out from newly formed cotton seeds. As the bowl ripens, it turns brown. The fibers, or cotton lint, expand during the hot summer months, and finally they split the bowl apart and the fluffy white cotton fiber, or lint, appear almost as snow in the field. At this time, the cotton is ready to harvest. It's pretty amazing that of these little flowers that um, produce a, a cotton bowl, which we can see, this is a, a typical sized cotton bowl, and of these bowls, it takes about 150,000 of them to make one bale of cotton, and a bale of cotton weighs 500 pounds. It takes about half a pound of cotton, or 150 of these bowls, to make that shirt Kristen is wearing. The backbreaking work of picking cotton used to be done manually, but today the harvesting is done mechanically by large cotton harvesters. Cotton from each field is packed into large modules, which are then taken to the cotton gin to separate the vegetation and seeds from the tenacious fiber. Not all cotton varieties produce the same length and quality of fiber. And so, like rice and corn, farmers and processors attempt to keep different types of cotton segregated so they can be marketed separately from each other. Because California has had such a reputation for high quality Akela cottons, there was concern when Pimas first came in that could the Pimas be kept separate. And even though they were higher quality, which is a funny thing, but the valley had such a uh, reputation for high quality Akelas that there was real concern that there be, be confusion in the marketplace. But it's turned out that the cotton marketing has been able to keep the qualities, the, the different types of cotton, very separate and has been able to successfully market them separately. How is this separation possible? Well, to start with, cotton is required to be grown from certified seed that is at least 98% pure, either Akela or Pima. When the cotton is harvested, the modules are tagged. Modules are then run through the cotton gin to separate the fiber from the seed, and the fiber is pressed into 500-pound cotton bales. Each bale is identified with a barcode that records its variety and origin, just like the items at the grocery store. Each cotton bale is subsampled, and detailed tests are carried out to determine its quality. The results of these tests are then made available to the cotton buyer. We've been growing Pima cotton on our farm since the early 90s. And when we began growing Pima, we realized we had to have separation between the two, uh, Akela and the Pima crops. So we've been doing this type of separation for quite a long time. Uh, it's just standard operating procedure for us here on the farm. So it's really nothing new. To, uh, to keep seed separate, to keep lint separate, to keep the cotton separate all the way uh, from start to finish. Maintaining the identity and integrity of different crops and food products is not a new concept in farming or at the grocery store. Different varieties are routinely displayed and priced separately, just as organically grown produce is often displayed and marketed in its own section. Farmers share a common interest in working together to deliver a variety of food choices 
to suit different consumer tastes and market preferences. Although there is no 100% guarantee that there will not be a little black rice in your basmati rice, blue corn in your white corn chips, or a kela cotton fiber in your pima cotton sheets, it occurs at low levels because farmers and processors routinely work to minimize any unwanted mixing that may occur between different crop varieties and types of food. There are as many different types of crops and farming systems as there are farmers, and each one must decide which combination works the best for them and their potential customers. But farming isn't just about the tough job of producing food. Some farmers provide opportunities for the public to visit their farms and see firsthand where food comes from and have some fun too. We've really uh, gone into something called agritainment. So my wife came up with the idea of um, we take a, a cornfield and we cut a maze into it for people and families to come out. And it's about two miles of trails. The families go out and um, they get lost together. Our motto is, is where uh, getting lost means finding fun. People learn about agriculture when they come out. We have animals to look at, all kinds, um, the, all the different crops growing. You know, we give them a tour around, so they get to see where food comes from. It's a way to attract the customers to our farm, and you know, to help pay some of the old bills and and keep our farm going for future generations. It just gives me a lot of pride because the farm's been in the family for you know, hundred and something years, and and being able to share that with people, we really like that. California has an enormously diverse and productive agriculture. It is the world's fifth largest supplier of food and agricultural commodities. It leads the nation in the production of fruits and vegetables. As we have seen, farmers choose to grow these different crops in the face of many challenges by using a variety of farming systems in order to provide a cornucopia of food choices to you, the consumer. Well, now we know where Kristen's lunch came from. Maybe she is not aware of the battles that go on in the cornfield between ears of corn and earworms, or about planes flying over flooded fields sowing the seeds that ultimately became the rice for her lunch, or about the dozens of snowy white cotton bowls that were picked to make her shirt. Fortunately for Kristen, farmers do know how to make corn, rice, and cotton grow. The corn, rice, and cotton grow. Oh. Corn, rice, and cotton grow. Do you or I or anyone know how corn, rice, and cotton grow? Now first the farmer, he sows the seed. And he stands up tall and takes his ease. He stamps his feet and claps his hands. And he turns around to view his lands. A corn, rice, and cotton grow. Oh, corn, rice, and cotton grow. Do you or I or anyone know how corn, rice, and cotton grow? And next, the farmer who waters the ground and he watches the sunshine all around. He stamps his feet and claps his hands and he turns around to view his lands. Corn, rice, and cotton grow. Oh, corn, rice, and cotton grow. Do you or I or anyone know how corn, rice, and cotton grow? How corn, rice, and cotton grow. The University of California's Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources produced the preceding program. Dedicated to serving people, the Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources strives to make life better for Californians in every corner of this fast-growing, ethnically diverse state. Call 1-800-994-8849 to request a free copy of our catalog or point your browser to anrcatalog.ucdavis.edu for our complete online catalog.